First, thank you very much um, to the organizers, especially Pavel Novatsky, for inviting me to take part in, in today's conference. As I think back in terms of memory with regard to the events of 1956, I've been in this very uh, hall numerous times, um, but particularly in 1996, there was a major conference here, which has, a few people have already alluded to it. Um, many of the people who took part in that um, are here, people like Jana Schreiner, Laszlo Buahi, um, Sasha Stikal, and, and, and others, and it's good to see them back here. That conference in particular, though, I think back, and there was a real air of excitement among scholars, especially because a lot of the materials were just being uncovered and collected. The 1956 Institute, which um, it, uh, w played a major role in organizing that conference, unfortunately it doesn't exist anymore, but it, uh, but it, it certainly um, was an institute that I valued in terms of memorializing these events, and, um, and I wish it did still exist. But the, uh, the um, that conference, and then in 2006, there was another conference held here. At that point, there had just been the turmoil on the streets of Budapest um, it, coming shortly before the conference. And so that conference had a different ear about it, I think um, partly affected by the events in Budapest at the time. Um, this year, 60 years on now, um, there are fewer of the participants in the 1956 re um, revolution. I'm very glad that we do have some here, especially ones who um, uh, can give excellent presentations. So the, um, uh, as I think back though at the 1996 conference, one of the most memorable parts of that for me was the participants and the opportunity we had to, with a round table, Ross Johnson was, uh, was one of the people taking part in that to be able to ask them about what they had actually been doing at the time, how things like Radio Free Europe affected them, if at all, and other such things. It's really the type of invaluable information you can get only from people who were there. Um, today I'm going to be in uh, this opening part. I'll be overlapping a little bit with the um, excellent earlier remarks by Lukasz Kaminski today, at least the first part of what he discussed. But I'm going to um, talk about, with Stalin's final years, I'll be looking at particularly the role of the Soviet Union in how, it, how the events of 1956 came about. But the, uh, in Stalin's final years, there were very ominous trends in the Soviet Union, including a vicious anti and violent anti-Semitic campaign. Um, apparent plans that Stalin had at the end of his life for a new uh, murderous purge of his top associates, undoubtedly including Anastas Mikoyan, Vyacheslav Molotov, uh, probably Lavrenti Beria, um, possibly others. So uh, his death on the 5th of March, 1953, uh, led to very prompt and rapid changes. What is significant about these is it indicates that all those around Stalin were anxious to change things because th when they moved so quickly after his death, something of that sort couldn't just happen on the spot spontaneously. There had to have been some uh, degree of thought about it beforehand, but none of it could actually occur while Stalin was alive. And so again, it indicates the enormous power and the, the terribly repressive power he was able to wield even in his final months when he became 
uh, physically much less um, vigorous than he had been. The, um, so shortly after, even in March of 1953, within a couple of weeks or so of Stalin's death, uh, there was already a reference, in this case it was a closed reference, by Georgi Malenkov, who had succeeded, who had succeeded uh, St um, Stalin. At least he had succeeded him in the sense that he was seen initially as the foremost leader. He had nothing like the comparable degree of authority and power that Stalin had. But the uh, but he referred in a closed meeting to the cult of personality, even though he didn't link it specifically to Stalin, it was very clear that that was what he had in mind. And the changes that occurred over the next few months in the Soviet Union and increasingly in the other uh, Soviet bloc countries indicated, a, again, a great desire to move away from the um, e extremely destructive sorts of practices that had been present under Stalin and that seemed to be um, returning in his final years. The abrupt introduction of these changes, sweeping domestic changes, the release of hundreds of thousands of political prisoners, the um, uh, disavowal of the doctor's plot, the, uh, mass, the mass amnesties, etc. many, many far-reaching internal reforms that were carried out in the Soviet Union, that the abrupt introduction of those changes and also the sharp rise of public expectations, particularly in Eastern Europe, spawned strikes and mass demonstrations in Bulgaria in May 1953, in the tobacco areas in uh, in Bulgaria, in both Plovdiv and Haskova, um, those were fairly easily suppressed, but they signaled a willingness to engage in mass protests that had not been possible under Stalin. There was subsequently uh, a rebellion in Czechoslovakia, in Pilsen, in early June, that again, took a very, very quickly took an anti-communist and anti-Soviet flavor to it, even though it stemmed initially from economic grievances. And then, of course, the much larger uprising in the German Democratic Republic two weeks later on the 17th of June, 1953, that ultimately had to be suppressed by Soviet troops because the East German Army and the East German uh, state the army, as it um, wasn't officially known, but the East German armed forces and the East German state security apparatus proved unable to put it down. Faced uh, with the prospect of losing a vital ally, the Soviet leadership decided, with essentially no debate, to rely on Soviet troops to put down the uprising. They did manage to put it down with very little blood, surprisingly little bloodshed. If you bear in mind that these two countries had been ferociously at war only eight years earlier, Soviet troops behaved with quite notable restraint in putting down the uprising, that there were very few people killed, which uh, considering that there were about 600,000 people taking part in the uprising is, is a very um, surprising outcome if you compare it, for example, with what happened three years later in Hungary where there were large numbers of people killed. The uh, Soviet Union's decisive response to the East German crisis was motivated in part by a concern that destabilizing unrest could spread to other East European countries, possibly even to the USSR itself, unless urgent steps were taken. So the protests and strikes that had occurred in those early months after Stalin's death in Bulgaria, in Hungary, uh, in Romania, but then particularly the large, much larger protests in Czechoslovakia and East Germany, um, demonstrated the potential for wider turmoil. As soon as Soviet officials in East Germany informed Khrushchev and other leaders in Moscow about the uprising on the 17th of June, the, they uh, again 
decided very quickly to rely on Soviet troops. Beria, who was then head of the, um, the enlarged Ministry of State Security, or Ministry of Internal Affairs, the um, Beria contacted the Soviet foreign intelligence station chiefs in all the East European countries and warned them that they would, quote, pay with their heads if anything like this happens, unquote, in the countries they were responsible for. So they were desperate to avoid the spread of such unrest to other countries. The use of Soviet military power in East Germany el eliminated the immediate problem facing the Soviet Union in, East Germ uh, in Eastern Europe, but the suppression of the uprising did not impart greater consistency to Soviet policy or eliminate the prospect of further turmoil in the Soviet bloc. The downfall of Beria in late June 1953 the formal appointment of Khrushchev as first secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in September of 1953 helped reduce the instability in Soviet domestic politics. Uh, but still, the leadership struggle in Moscow continued to affect Soviet uh, East European relations over the next few years. During the brief time that Malenkov, Georgi Malenkov, was Soviet Prime Minister from March 1953 to February 1955, the Soviet government encouraged a significant relaxation of economic and political controls in Eastern Europe, similar to the changes that were being adopted in the Soviet Union itself. Violent mass terror in the region came to an end. It lasted a little longer in the East Central European countries than it did in the Soviet Union, but it, uh, it did come to an end. Vast numbers of political prisoners were released. So the reforms in the East Bloc countries after June 1953 were not as far-reaching as those proposed before Beria's removal, but they did represent a notable and permanent departure from Stalinism. In a region like Eastern Europe, which had been so tightly compressed during the Stalin era, the sudden liberalization uh, greatly increased the potential for social and political upheaval, which again is the uh, key, I think, to understanding the events of 1956, that much of this had already been um, preceded in 1953 with events that showed the potential for what could occur. Leaders in Moscow at the time, though, were still preoccupied with domestic affairs and the ongoing struggle for power, and they didn't really appreciate the increasingly volatile conditions in the Eastern Bloc. Um, this is evident, for example, in the policies that Khrushchev adopted early on in 1954 and 1955 as he moved against what was then his chief rival, um, Malenkov, that uh, to outflank Malenkov in the leadership struggle in late 1954, early 1955, Khrushchev had temporarily sided with the hardliners on the Soviet Presidium, and that shift was promptly reflected throughout the Soviet bloc. Uh, at Khrushchev's behest, the East Central European governments slowed or reversed uh, many of the economic and political reforms they had implemented after Stalin's death. And in Hungary, the reformist prime minister, as we know, Imre Nagy, uh, was removed in April 1955 by, uh, by uh, Rakoshi, who earlier had been forced to yield the prime ministerial post to to two years uh, earlier under Soviet pressure. And the new Hungarian prime minister, Hegu, uh, Andras Hegudus, was a much um, weaker figure than Knight. Uh, Rakashi was able then to reacquire a dominant political role in the country and to undo many of the recently enacted reforms. Khrushchev himself later acknowledged in a conversation with Chinese communist leaders that one of his, quote, most serious mistakes, in un unquote, in 1955, was when he started, quote, supporting that idiot Rakashi again, unquote. 
So the sudden dampening of public expectations in Hungary and other East European countries, expectations that had been raised by the new courses of the previous two years, helped to generate strong currents of, of public discontent. And so in my, um, what remains in my presentation, let me just trace that out. I'm obviously not going to discuss the events of, um, of uh, October, November, 1956, uh, June, October, November, 1956 themselves. Other presentations at this conference will get into that. Instead, I want to just trace out a bit more the genesis of those events. Mullenkopf had been able to avoid the emergence of widespread political unrest in Eastern Europe after the June 1953 upheavals by pressing ahead with steps to improve living conditions, to boost consumer output, to provide for greater official responsiveness to public concerns on a wide range of matters. But after Khrushchev forced Malenkov to the sidelines in early 1955, replacing him uh, with Nikolai Bulganin as prime minister, um, in, Khrushchev began curtailing the scope and pace of the post-Stalin reforms. He inadvertently increased the potential for mass protests and destabilization in East Central Europe. Uh, let me just uh, quickly come to the events of February 1956, and in particular, Khrushchev's secret speech. The tw Soviet uh, 20th Party Congress was the first party congress after Stalin's death, and therefore was of particular significance. The public portion of that, uh, of the conference, was itself significant. It lay out it laid out um, bold reforms that um, even on their own would have been, uh, would have been significant. The, but in particular, that was then followed by a closed session at the, on the final day of the conference in which Khrushchev den uh, denounced many, certainly not all, of Stalin's crimes and the speech, even though the speech itself was, is often referred to as the secret speech, it remains secret for a remarkably brief time. If you consider that Soviet Union and East Central European countries did have censorship at the time, it's still remarkable in retrospect how little they were able uh, to do to keep the content of that secret speech from becoming uh, widely known in their societies. The extent to which it became known was evident as early in the Soviet Union as early as the 9th of March when protests broke out in the Georgian capital, uh, Tbilisi. In that case, it was protests that were in favor of Stalin. But, the, um, but still, it indicated that the nature of the speech was becoming well known. This was in part because the speech was distributed to lower level party organizations and they were required to inform their members of the content. The full text wasn't distributed at the time. But then certainly in Poland by uh, April 1956, the speech was actually available for sale um, unofficially in public, um, public markets. The, um, the uh, content of the speech had been broadcast by Radio Free Europe starting on the 17th of March um, into, uh, into East European countries, but it's clear that the content of it had become known even before that. So um, in uh, coming to my concluding comments then, let me, um, say that in looking at the impact of that secret speech is that because its contents became so widely known and then the full text was made uh, available in um, early June 1956 uh, in the United States, the, um, the impact of that speech in Central and Eastern Europe is again hard to overstate. Many of the materials that have emerged have underscored this in various countries, not just in Poland and Hungary, 
but also, for example, in Bulgaria, where the content of the, the um, speech very quickly became known, or in Romania as well. The, um, there will be speakers here discussing, um, at least Romania, Stefano Bottoni will be here, uh, uh, is here to discuss. But the, um, the final point that I will come to is that in looking at how de-Stalinization proceeded, it had begun shortly after Stalin's death, within uh, hours of Stalin's death even, but then gained pace in the spring of 1953. There was an interlude during the time that Khrushchev uh, was moving to, uh, was moving against Georgi Malenkov, but then when Khrushchev returned decisively to de-Stalinization in February of 1956 uh, with the secret speech and the measures that followed, it was uh, something that was bound to lead to major developments in the Soviet bloc. What form those developments took depended on the nature of uh, the populations and uh, officials in the particular countries, but Khrushchev himself had set the stage for what occurred in 1956. Uh, thank you. <laughs>